Welcome to the Deutsches Tank Museum in Munster for another in the series Inside the Tanks. Behind me, as I'm sure you recognize, is the Jagdpanzer 38T, otherwise known as the Hetzer, one of the most interesting armored vehicles of World War II. Let me try to position this vehicle for you. Following the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, it quickly became obvious that Germany needed more and better anti-tank solutions. Both the infantry's anti-tank guns and the Panzer 3s and 4s of the time were unable to penetrate the front armour of Russia's KV-1s and T-34s. Even the Stug, which then only had the short-barreled 75mm gun, wasn't up to the job. It was also a numbers game. Allied tank production was outpacing Germany's, so solutions were needed that were cheaper and faster to build, which meant using existing chassis. This resulted in the Marder series of tank destroyers and later the Nashorns. But while all could carry powerful guns, they had thin armour, open crew compartments and a high profile, which made them easy targets. They could dish out the punishment, but they couldn't take it. So in late 1943, Hitler called for increased production of light tank destroyers that could combine good speed with a powerful gun and better protection. One result was the Hetzer, which means chaser. The chassis chosen was taken from the Panzer 38T, a median tank which was originally designed and built in Czechoslovakia before being taken over by Germany. The tank itself was by now undergunned and obsolete, but the chassis and engine were reliable and strong and already been used for the Marder III. It was partly because the chassis already existed that the Hetzer, incredibly, was able to go from the drawing board to production in less than four months. The Hetzer was designed to be small, fast and carry a big punch. It was also designed to be hard to spot and even harder to hit. Just look at how low it is, less than two meters high with the gun very near to the top of the vehicle. It was also quite short, just 4.7 meters. That's two meters shorter than the Stug. But the most conspicuous feature of this compact tank destroyer is of course, this very sloped front armor sweeping back at 60 degrees on the upper hull and 40 degrees below. Both upper and lower hull armour were 60 millimetres thick, welded together and interlocked for additional strength. The side armour, while nicely sloped at 40 degrees, was a different story. Just 20 millimetres thick, which made it very vulnerable to penetration from the side by almost any Allied tank or anti-tank gun and even Russian anti-tank rifles. Tactics for using the Hetzer then were very simple. Find a nice ambush position, keeping its strong sloped frontal armor facing the enemy, then get the hell out of there if there was any danger of being outflanked. The gun was one of the best anti-tank guns of World War II, the 7.5 centimeter Pac-39. It was capable of punching through 82 millimeters of armor at 1,000 meters and 91 millimeters of armor at 500 meters enough to take out most Allied tanks of the day, including the T-34. Its standard anti-tank ram was the Panzer Granata 39. This was composed of a ballistic shield to help the shell fly straight. Behind this was a cap of very hard steel to crack the hardened face of the enemy armor. Behind this was a heavy core to enlarge the hole and complete penetration. And inside this was an explosive charge to maximize fragmentation of the core, causing maximum damage inside the tank. At the rear was the fuse and tracer to help the gunner see the fall of shot. As you can see, the gun was mounted well to the right of the vehicle, which restricted its traverse to the left to just five degrees, because movement of the gun assembly inside would be stopped by the right hole wall. To the right, it could traverse further up to 11 degrees. But at a total of 16 degrees, this was well short of the Hetzer's original specification, which called for 30 degrees. So for targets outside the narrow field of fire, especially to the left, the whole vehicle would have to be moved. Let's take a look at some of the Hetzer's other external features. Here we've got the commander's hatch, and next to it, the escape hatch for the driver, the gunner, and the loader. Then we've got various vision devices for when the whole vehicle was closed up. The commander's rear-facing periscope, the gunner's periscope sight, the loader's periscope, 
and the driver's twin periscope. There was also a periscope sight for the machine gun. The machine gun itself was an MG34 Rundum Foyer machine gun, obviously missing. Rundum Foyer meaning all-round fire, which meant it could literally be rotated through 360 degrees and fired remotely from inside by the loader. This gun shield protected the loader when he had to change magazines or was firing from an open hatch. From the side, the Hetzer silhouette is unmistakable, not just because of the slopes front and rear, but because of the four large diameter road wheels. Drive was through a front sprocket and the tracks were quite narrow at 35 centimeters. Notice the shirts are, or skirts, five millimeter thick steel plates that added extra protection to the side armor. Like the chassis, the Praga engine was also Czech designed and built. A six cylinder 7.8 litre petrol unit driving the front sprockets through a five speed semi automatic gearbox. The original target weight for the Hetzer had been 13 metric tons, but it ended up at 16 tons combat weight, making it much slower than originally planned, with a maximum speed of 40 km per hour on good roads and just 15 km per hour cross country. Let's take a look inside. Well, I told you it was small. There's only me and the cameraman in here and it already feels overcrowded. You can now see why the gun has to be placed to the right. The Hetzer is so narrow that if it had been placed more conventionally near the middle, there would have been no room for the crew. Which is why three of the four crew had to sit in a row to the left of the gun. Up front was the driver, behind him was the gunner, and behind him was the loader. The commander sat here, at the rear on the right, directly behind the gun, with his hatch and periscope above. The loader probably had the most challenging job, since the Pac-39 gun had been designed to be mounted centrally, with the loader standing to the right of it. But in the Hetzer, as we've seen, this wasn't possible. So he had to reach over the recoil guard to feed shells into the breech and arm the firing mechanism. And while some of the Hetzer's 41 rounds of ammunition were stowed conventionally next to him, some were also stowed on the other side of the gun, forcing him again to reach over to get at it. Hard to believe that four guys had to live and fight in here. Its gun could penetrate the frontal armour of a T-34-85 at 700 metres and, if the crew dared, it could knock out an IS-2 at 100 metres. Thanks to its gun-limited traverse, the Hetzer constantly had to change position to engage new targets, which often gave away its position, exposing its thin side armour to flanking fire. But with good positioning, a company of Hetzers working together and getting their shots in first could dish out some serious damage to attacking enemy armour. Because it was deployed quite late in the war, few combat reports survive, but one from the Eastern Front reported a single company of Hetzers destroying 20 enemy tanks with no losses. Another unit, also from the Eastern Front, reported 57 enemy tanks destroyed, including two IS-2s, also with no losses. In the right hands, this little tank destroyer could certainly do the job. <laughs> 